This video was made possible through the support of my patrons. Let's regroup with the convoluted origin story of Doctor Who. It's December 1963, and Doctor Who was now well underway and slowly starting to build an audience. The Daleks had yet to capture the public imagination, so the future of the show was far from assured. Now, the show was initially greenlit for a 13 episode run four episodes for the Caveman story, seven episodes for Terry Nation's Mutants, leaving two remaining. However, production was not ready to start for the next story, titled A Journey to Cafe, written by Sidney Newman's Avengers collaborator, John Lucarotti, based on Marco Polo. The sets and the costumes were taking a long time to assemble, so the team needed a two-week buffer. But there were even more issues. The Dalek props and the Dalek city sets had destroyed the show's budget prospects, meaning that the money for the initial 13 episode run had almost dried up. So Verity Lambert assigned story editor David Whittaker to create this filler serial, where the only actors available would be our lead four, and that the TARDIS was the only location they could use. That makes The Edge of Destruction, with its second episode being called The Brink of Disaster, the distillation of can I copy your homework but yes don't make it too obvious, a really interesting and noteworthy chapter in Doctor Who history. Even to this day, there has never been another episode that was set entirely within the TARDIS, or to just revolve around its central cast, with the closest being 2011's The Girl Who Waited, depending on if you count the check-in hologram, the voice cast, and the handbot actors. It's a really experimental serial that's clearly being held together production-wise by a wish and a dream, with David Whittaker having to forego his story editor credit so as to not upset the Writers Guild, only having two days to write the story, describing putting the episodes together as a, quote, nightmare. The initial director had to drop out and be replaced by Richard Martin, making his directorial debut for part one, and then Martin was unavailable for part two and had to be replaced by Frank Cox also making his directorial debut here. We even had composer Brian Hodgson unable to put together an original score and having to rely on radiophonic workshop samples. So with all of that in mind, surely The Edge of Destruction is either an absolute mess or an underrated gem, right? Well, not quite, but let me back up. So the episode picks up where the Daleks ended, with some turbulence affecting the TARDIS, knocking our crew to the ground. Barbara recuperates first to find the Doctor has cut his head open on the fall, with Ian and Susan acting a bit strange. When the Doctor gets treated, he starts to accuse his new human passengers of sabotage and mutiny, while Susan starts threatening the group with a pair of scissors. The characters are pushed to the brink as they aim to discover what's happening to them and whether or not something might also be inside the ship with them. Now, to the story's credit, it knew exactly what to do with the format. Two 20-ish minute episodes is the perfect amount of time to tell a story like this. I'd hate to see what a seven-part version of The Edge of Destruction looked like, but at two episodes and broadcasting for just two weeks in February 1964, it's snappy and it makes for a great bottle story that keeps its cards very close to its chest until the end. David Whittaker's script feels like something from The Twilight Zone, which had been broadcasting on CBS for over four years at this point. In fact, by an odd stroke of fate, The Twilight Zone would end only a couple of months after this episode's broadcast. Coincidence? I think not! Now, for The Edge of Destruction, I think this is a story where the parts don't add up to the most compelling whole, but there are a few incredible scenes and moments here, like Susan fainting early on and Ian takes her to the medical bay. He goes to get water from a nearby dispenser and returns only for Susan to be threatening him with a pair of scissors, and... No. Who are you? Susan. You don't need that. <gasps> ah! Believe it or not, the BBC received complaints about this episode because of Susan's off-kilter behaviour and it was scaring the kids at home. 
And you know what? I don't blame them. I actually think this is Carol Ann Ford's best performance in the role, where she's living up to the unearthly child aspect of the character, while she appears to be possessed by some other entity that has managed to sneak on board the TARDIS when the doors were open. And it's not just Susan behaving off kilter, as Ian tries to strangle the Doctor for the serial's sole cliffhanger. The clocks start melting, including the crew's wristwatches, and all of this causes tensions to escalate between the Doctor and Barbara, seemingly the only ones unaffected by what's going on. At least, that's my interpretation of the story. With the Doctor on the defensive and paranoid, he threatens to eject the teachers out of the ship, and even drugs their drinks so he can investigate the TARDIS console on his own. And after everything that this team have been through over the past three months of TV, Barbara snaps. I know now who's responsible. You are. You sabotaged my ship. What are you doing to your ship? Strange. You're the cause of this disaster, and you both knocked you, you knocked both Susan and I uh, unconscious. Oh, don't be ridiculous. We were all knocked out. Oh, Sherard, you attacked us. Absolute nonsense. When we were lying helpless on the floor, you trampled with my, my control. But why would we? For what reason? Blackmail, that's why. You tried to force me to return you to England. Oh, don't be so stupid. I know it. I'm sure of it. How dare you! Do you realise, you stupid old man, that you'd have died in the Cave of Skulls if Ian hadn't made fire for oh, you? Oh, I tried. And what about what we went through against the Daleks? Not just for us, but for you and Susan, too. And all because you tricked us into going down to the city. But I... Uh... Accuse us? You ought to go down on your hands and knees and thank us. But gratitude's the last thing you'll ever have, or any sort of common sense, either. The mission statement for the Edge of Destruction is basically to shatter any connections between the four, or at least between the Doctor and the Coal Hill teachers, in order for them to come together and allow that connection to mend and then crystallise into something stronger. And when viewed as just a two-part story, it does feel a bit rushed for that. However, this isn't just a story. It's almost like a season finale, serving as a capper for the previous 11 episodes. Viewed in isolation, The Edge of Destruction is a strange, experimental, and often scary low-budget thriller, but it's not meant to be viewed in isolation. It's a pretty definitive endpoint for this stage of the main character's journeys, not necessarily the end of the show, though it could have been had the Daleks not started exploding in the ratings at the same time this episode was filming, but a new status quo shift. It's after the edge of destruction that you can see the Doctor start to soften, and that's mainly due to the events of the story humbling him, particularly to Barbara, especially once he realises that the problem ultimately had nothing to do with them. But what was the issue? Well, the answer is as anticlimactic as it is brazen. So the issue is that in The Daleks, the Doctor used a mechanism on the TARDIS console called the Fast Return Switch to head back in time quickly so he can return Ian and Barbara to London in the past since Scarrow was in the future. However, the spring mechanism of the switch jammed, meaning that the TARDIS was stuck going backwards in time, ultimately to the very beginning of the solar system, the magnetic force of which was causing the heart of the TARDIS to escape from the central column. So yeah, a faulty spring. Yes, there you are, you see? What's wrong? The spring's not connecting. It's come up the base of... Hurry. Wait, there we are, we'll take it up. Now, luckily we can turn it over and... Now it should work. There. Ah, that's all right. And the doors opening and closing, the pictures appearing on the screen, the melting clocks, the fault locator flashing so everything was wrong, and yes, even the possession of Ian and Susan was an attempt by the TARDIS itself to warn the crew of the fast return switch issue. And that's the bit that really stretches credibility. First things first, why didn't the fault locator just highlight the fast return switch? I know they acknowledged this by saying that it was technically working so the fault locator couldn't detect it, but after everything that happened in this story, there's surely a way to communicate that. Which brings me on to my second point. If the TARDIS is able to put pictures on the screen or possess the main characters, why not give them a more direct message? And it's not like that was never an option. 
After all, the fast return switch is even written on the TARDIS console in black felt tip. Though to be fair, it was apparently written on the console by a member of the production team to help with the rehearsals, and it was meant to be removed before the cameras rolled, but it just never was. So yeah, it's a really anticlimactic solution. Not in terms of the scope, because that actually works. The idea that the Doctor is learning more about the ship he and his granddaughter are exiled in, and that it might be more than just a machine. You say it has a built-in defense mechanism? Yes, it has. Well, that's where we've been wrong. Originally, the machine wasn't at fault, we were. And it's been trying to tell us so ever since. A machine that can think for itself? Yes. Is that feasible, Doctor? Oh, think not as you or I do, but uh, it must be able to think as a machine. You see, it has a bank of computers. And yeah, it makes sense that if the TARDIS is stuck going back in time, then they're heading towards self-destruction. But I think it's the mixture of the low-tech solution of the high-tech spaceship and the obfuscation of the messaging that the TARDIS was giving. Like, seriously, I have no idea how the group, Barbara in particular, figured out the mystery. It's definitely every quarter of a minute. Well, what does that prove? that we have a measure of time as long as it lasts. Yes, of course. That explains the clock face. We had time taken away from us, and now it's been given back to us because it's running out. So, logically, if she weighs the same as a duck, she's made of wood. And therefore... A witch! A witch! A witch! Now... If you're someone who needs the internal mechanisms of a story to be airtight, or needs everything to 100% add up, then this is absolutely going to irk you. However, I think the delivery makes the difference here, because of how the story does manage to deliver this abstract imagery inspired by Salvador Dali, and also how William Hartnell in the third act of the serial takes centre stage and performs what can only be described as a soliloquy as he realises where the TARDIS is taking them. We are at the very beginning. The new start of a solar system. Outside, the atoms are rushing towards each other, fusing, coagulating, until minute little collections of matter are created. And so the process goes on and on until dust is formed. Dust then becomes solid entity, a new birth of a sudden, and it's planets. <laughs> it's such a magic minute of Doctor Who, not just because everyone was off camera praying that Hartnell would remember his lines, but because he's able to exposit the dialogue with such wonder and glee. Just look at the joy on his face towards the end. It's so sublime. This is clearly a transformative story for the Doctor, even demonstrated as the Doctor is given a head bandage that's multicoloured, and as his wounds heal, the colours start to disappear, showing the Doctor gaining more clarity as the story goes along, until the end, when he has to face up to his behaviour. Well, uh, that's uh, you, young lady. Well, uh, you were absolutely right. It was your instinct and intuition against my logic, and uh, you succeeded. I mean, the blackouts and, and uh, still pictures and, 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 uh, and the clock. Well, uh, you read a story into all these things and uh, was determined to hold on to it. We all owe you our lives. I... The TARDIS lands somewhere snowy, so the Doctor visits Barbara to let her know, and she still hasn't forgiven him yet, leading to this bespoke perfect scene. You said terrible things to us. Yes, I suppose it's the injustice that's upsetting you, and when I made a threat to put you off the ship, it must have affected you very deeply. What do you care what I think or feel? Yes, we learn about each other, so we learn about ourselves. We've seen real change over the past few stories of this trickster alien who emerged from the fog in Totter's Lane, and he's done now the most grown-up thing of his life so far. 
admit when he was wrong, and own up to it. That probably means a lot from Barbara's perspective, and because he's done that, the story can go on. So, The Edge of Destruction is a small chapter in Doctor Who history, but an absolutely pivotal one. It's clearly a cost-cutting story, and no amount of exemplary dialogue from David Whittaker can hide that, but it embraces those limitations to give us a thoughtful character piece revolving around the Doctor and Barbara. The ending lets it down in a plot capacity, but as a vessel to grow the characters and move them forward together, it succeeds. But join us next time as we review the original Lost Doctor Who epic, as we find the Doctor, Susan, Ian and Barbara in 13th century China and on the caravan of Marco Polo. Because now that the kids are on board with all this science fiction stuff and the show's immediate future is locked in, Sidney Newman's vision of an educational show can finally come to fruition. I'll see you all next time. Aha, I bet you didn't think I could get 15 minutes of review out of a two-part classic series story, but I did it. Gosh darn, I did it, because that's just how we roll here. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please consider hitting that like button, leaving a comment down below to appease the almighty YouTube algorithm, and you can also subscribe to keep up to date on when I do other Doctor Who reviews, including ones in this very marathon. I also wanted to take this opportunity to thank Chris Johnson, who's a friend of mine who lent me all of the classic series Doctor Who DVDs that I needed for this marathon. He lent me all of the Dalek stories, Cybran stories, and now all the Hartnell stories for my marathons. Thank you for your massive DVD collection. Without you, I wouldn't be able to get the footage for these reviews. I'd also like to thank my patrons who helped to keep the lights on here and help to make these reviews possible. You should be seeing the names of all of my patrons on screen right now, scrolling down those beautiful bastards, and I'd like to give a shout out to these particular patrons. Adam Gratton, Angus Bajanison, Callum Baird, Chiba City Blues, Dan the Dreamer Shill, Daniel Davis, Darren Carver Bausiger, Dean Jones, Dr. Hadley, Dragon Bugs, Dylan Whitaker, Evil Dialect 79, Finley Rude, Flipmeister MK, Ginger Animator, Hunter Graham, Jack D. Evans, James Ivory, Jared Saylor, Joseph Adams, Leela, Mario Fanboy 15, Matthew Perry, Michael Serrano, Miranda Logan, Nate Harris, Nathaniel Holden, Palex, Raven Woods, Reese Lloyd, Ross, Samuel Whitaker, Steve Fiore, Taylor Wooderson, The Brit Sniper, The Doctor 14 Blu-ray Reviews, Timbo 1834, Toby Loxton, Will, Zabi555, and Strange Folk. Thanks so much to all of my patrons for making these videos possible, and I'll see you folks next time.